Hello, welcome to at and Threat Track for July 21st, 2014. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today I'm joined by, uh, here we have uh, John Hugelboom. And John, you've been kind of busy this morning, so. <laughs> yes, I have. I don't know if we really want to discuss it in depth, but just working some service issues and whatnot. Okay, yeah. good. Also joined by Matt Kaiser. And uh, Matt, you've been busy with some service development activities, right? I have. Uh... Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> so, I don't want to go into it either. As we've been saying, I'll keep him busy here. And uh, online, joined by Tony Tortorisi. And uh, Tony, I guess uh, you were just recently quoted in a uh, networking exchange blog. Can you mention something about that? Sure, yeah. Um, basically, you know, spam always continues. And uh, that blog has a little bit of information on on spam and uh, how, to, how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that later in the program. I guess, uh, you know, part of it is, I guess, a user awareness topic. So uh, we'll discuss that uh, in perhaps a little more detail. But first, let's go to John here. And uh, we came across an article by a researcher about a new botnet that isn't just for Windows anymore. Right. And so, you know, uh, I guess the caveat to all this is I think we've talked in the past that uh, it, malware doesn't infect only Windows machines. Um, we've talked about, you know, embedded routers getting infected with things. This is somewhat similar in a way. This mm -hmm. is um, the guys from Virus Bolton who we talked about. Actually, Matt covered that. That they started publicly releasing a lot of their articles that used to be a subscription service. Mm -hmm. uh, they came out with another article recently uh, talking about the Mayhem uh, botnet, and it's a botnet that's basically composed of Linux and Unix servers. And the way it works is. It scans for vulnerable machines. This is not new either. We've seen this a lot, particularly with some other actors back in the 2012, 2013 timeframe. Uh, they look for various vulnerabilities in web servers. Well, what these guys are doing, or this particular botnet is doing, is they're looking for um, uh, web servers that have a remote file inclusion vulnerability. And what that means is, in the URL, you can specify a file name, and uh, if the you know, when the server reads that URL, he will go in remotely include that file in the output mm -hmm. of the page. So um, there's various software that has these vulnerabilities through remote file inclusion. Some of them are older versions of WordPress and uh, other things like that, other content management systems. And I actually have an example uh, on the screenshot here. And what they're actually doing is they're going to fetch um, the remote file inclusion that they try is the google.com humans.txt file, mm -hmm. which if you're not familiar with that, it's um, kind of Google's play on the robots.txt file, which you know most websites will set up a robots.txt file and it tells automated web crawlers what to uh, pay attention to or not pay attention to if they don't want you to index certain part portions of your website. Mm -hmm. um, the humans.txt is just Google's text file. It's basically advertising, hey, Congratulations, you found this. Maybe you want to, you know, uh, submit for a job at Google. You know, things like that. It's basically a little self-advertising campaign. Mm -hmm. In any event, so should that succeed, what this script does is it tries to do the remote file inclusion. If it actually receives the text that's in that file, it does a little string comparison on it. Um, then it knows, okay, this machine's vulnerable, and it'll go do a follow-up where it actually imports a PHP script. Mm -hmm. And then when that gets output, now the machine, the web server, executes whatever is in that PHP script, right. which is going to uh, pull some additional malware files, Unix, Linux-based malware, down to the machine, uh, execute that malware. It's going to probably run under the effective user ID of the web server process, because mm -hmm. that's who actually downloaded it and stored it on the machine, hides it in a hidden directory, um, and then starts doing other, you know, basically, now that machine's in the botnet, goes to command and control, receives instructions to go look for more machines and spread and things right. like that. So this particular uh, malware family, they're calling it Mayhem. And, uh, you know, probably not uh, the only of this variety out there, but yeah. it's a pretty good article that they put together. So I'd recommend if you're not familiar with this type of tactic and you have web servers that you operate or manage, it's a really interesting article to go read through, because it shows mm -hmm. you kind of the whole process from beginning to end, what kind of malware gets dropped, how they're, you know, um, uh, you know, how they're managing and operating that botnet mm -hmm. with the various pieces. Yeah, there's a really, a really good description of how the malware works. Yes. And uh, not a very good description about, or I mean, did they say much about how this botnet is being used? 
for other purposes beyond that? I didn't see, I don't recall that it was in okay. there, you know, yeah, if there's some see, other purpose behind it yet. And um, the, uh, the other portion of it is it wasn't very clear about the command and control or how to actually detect if you might be infected with this sort of thing, right. unless you have access to the server itself. So right. from a network monitoring point of view, it wasn't particularly helpful. But yes, I agree with you, a very good detailed article about the malware itself. And, uh, but these, this is obviously the kind of thing we need to be looking out for. You mentioned the privileges. It would, be, it would not necessarily have the opportunity to, to perform things on the ser as root on the server, but it would be operating with whatever privileges the web server has. Right, because uh, the process that downloaded and stored the files and executed right. the commands, right? Yeah, and it, but if they were very clever, they might be able to do something to do a privilege escalation, sure. another exploit, Absolutely. to uh, subsequently escalate their privileges, gain control of the entire server, and do some other things Right, as well. and it, you know, the, from the article, it did mention that several different modules get downloaded, uh, lots of them, mm -hmm. maybe upper in the terms of 20s to even more. Mm -hmm. So there might be certain things that they just automatically download. Let me try to see if I can do some privilege escalation here really easily. Right. And if not, then they just have it do, you know, act as a bot. But if they can escalate, then they could do some things as root and then maybe mm -hmm. use that as a, a higher tier part of the botnet, right. you know, someday, at, you know, in the future and whatnot. So at the very least, they would be able to get access to the data that's on the web server. Mm -hmm. And they would be able to uh, perform denial of service attacks like we've seen before. Uh, somewhat constrained in the type of attack they could perform. They wouldn't be able to do address spoofing very easily, but they certainly could use it to initiate connections to other systems. So mm -hmm. those would be the kinds of indications you could look for. Uh, network indicators, in fact, you'd want to do anyway. If you're expecting a lot of influx of uh, requests and you know responses out from your server and that role reverses, you might suspect there's something going on. So those types of uh, sort of uh, behavioral profiles would be ones to, to, to be good to watch for. And if you have control of the web server process itself, you can also do things like add content to the right. site. So if you're getting a bunch of requests for URIs that you aren't yours, or defacement, you know. Right. Or exploit kits, mm -hmm. yep. turn it Absolutely. into another, you know, yep. Yep. drive by, downloads, drive -by downloads, right, things Absolutely. like that. Yeah, good points. Okay, so let's uh, go on to our next story here, and this is one, you know, last week we were talking about, um, you know, the 10 impermeable, I, I don't remember this, laws of uh, security, mm -hmm. and uh, one of them happened to be if the attacker or the bad guy has physical access to your computer, it's no longer your computer. Right. And uh, so now we're thinking about things that we didn't think of as computers to be computers, and Right. Is that a good setup, Matt? It's a pretty good setup, actually. <laughs> um, so there's news out of um, a Chinese security vendor, Chihu 360, mm -hmm. uh, who's apparently a very big name over there, um, but I'd only personally just heard of them. Um, they had put a bounty on the Tesla S. Say, if you can do anything to hack this car, we will provide a bounty to you. Mm. And apparently at their latest conference um, in China, someone managed to gain control of some of the peripherals inside the car, um, the roof, the, you know, the roof, moon roof thing that opens up. Okay. I can't think of the word for it. Yeah, uh, sunroof. Sunroof, thank yeah. you. Moon roof, uh, sunroof. Moon roof, sunroof. It depends on whether it's day or night, you know. Exactly. <laughs> very, very good point. Uh, I believe the lights, other things like that. So basically control of the motor systems of the car that had nothing to do with driving the car. But um, they haven't given the details out as to exactly how this has been mm. done. So at this point, it's speculation. Some people were claiming that they may have broken the six-digit pin mm -hmm. that allows you to control certain aspects of the car from your phone. So it may be over the wireless, but it may be a physical attack. We don't know yet. But the point being that you know, here we are treating you know a, a luxury car like a computer because for all intents and purposes it is. It has the same kind of attack interfaces, mm -hmm. same kind of control over critical systems. So, I mean, like, like you said, you know, if someone has physical access to your car or close proximity that's, you know, equivalent to, mm -hmm. you can control this car and do all sorts of terrible things with it. Um, this is not exactly a new space for attack, uh, but the Tesla S being a very well-known, high-value car, this is kind of important. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually reminded me of a book that just came out, the, the Car Hacker's Handbook, which I believe is free on opengarages.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually got some really good information about the different types of systems you find inside modern cars, like uh, the CAN bus, which is basically a network within your car mm -hmm. through which all of the electronic systems interface to each other. So maybe you've got your entertainment system on there, but you may have things like the motors for your uh, rear view mirrors. Mm -hmm. You may have the braking systems in the engine as well hooked up to the CAN bus. So um, 
it's it's a basically a computer system with some very interesting inputs and outputs. Right, right. And you know, I think one of the things is perhaps protected a little bit is that there is a sort of a proprietary or a specialized nature of the way the networking is done in cars in comparison to our typical home environment. So a little less accessible from a hacking standpoint, but once you are invested or vested in uh, the opportunity to do that hacking, perhaps some of the other attributes, the security attributes, perhaps are not as strong as some others because they are relatively specialized and they're, you know, there may be a little bit banking on that. It's sort of the security through obscurity kind of philosophy. Right. I'm speculating to some extent, but there's a reasonable chance that that's... Well, in my opinion, I think that it's, it's only a matter of time right. before people start developing these interfaces and making them widely available. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have been for years using the OBD2 bus, which mm -hmm. is a diagnostic port in most modern cars as well, just to do things like uh, tuning the engine perhaps, or just to read out, you know, do I have error codes associated with my you know, fuel injector or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but those interfaces are dirt cheap. You can get those, you can get Bluetooth ones that hook up to your smartphone today. Right. So I think the CAN bus can't be too far away. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. I'm kind of surprised by this contest because I would think the greatest barrier to entry would be that I have to get a Tesla S and buy it. In order, you know, because how <laughs> yeah, else are you going to really kind of apply and practice to see what the vulnerabilities are unless you have one to kind of play yeah. with, you know? That's true, but if they're using the standard types of, of, of buses within the, the car, the same kind of sure. networking, maybe there's a general purpose right. attack that you can do. Try yeah. some things ahead of time and then just go to the parking lot and see, find one in the parking lot, see well, if it if, works. If you're the guys who drive up to the convention in a Tesla S, <laughs> uh, right, right. maybe you've already got something in your pocket that you're yeah. going to show That's off. A possibility. You know, you're, you, you, I'm, it's a little bit of a flashback here. I, you know, I used to track... Um, you know, some of the older cars, and there was a time period, I think it was a 67 Shelby Mustangs, Hertz had, was renting those for a period of time. And there was, you know, there were lots of stories about people renting it and literally welding roll bars into it, running it in a race and then taking it back out and renting it, <laughs> and it back. So I'm not suggesting anybody could go out and rent a Tesla and then, and then uh, see if they can hack into it. But, you know, the barrier to entry might not be quite as big as mm. actually buying it. Good point. Okay, so uh, before we uh, burn that one to the ground, let's go ahead and to the next story here. And uh, Tony, as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, I guess we had a viewer mailbag of, uh, a few weeks ago where we talked a little bit about looking at email headers, and uh, we thought it would be good to bring an expert in here. And Tony, uh, for folks that aren't aware, uh, what kind of work do you do? Uh, I do email security for uh, AT&T. I do a lot of research and remediation when it comes down to uh, anything that's SMTP for uh, for the company. So there's a there's a lot lot going on when it comes down to it. Mm -hmm. A lot of different things when dealing with malware. I mean, working with John and and Matt and and yourself with some of the some of the examples that come around. Things get busy around here. Right, and so uh, I think we've really brought the expert here, and I guess uh, you're going to walk us through some of the things that you can look for in an uh, email header to try to get at least some idea whether it looks suspicious or not. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up, it was based on a question when they were talking about when viewing potential spam, uh, the new Yahoo Mail does not appear to allow you to hover over any of the URLs. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for this is it's, it's security conscious. When there is a suspicious email, it's moved into a spam folder. Right. And what happens is they actually defang the email so the reader doesn't make you know an accidental click on something instead of hovering over the email and sending them to a place where they really shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So Yahoo has taken a couple extra steps to decrease the amount of information you can get right from the the front of the email which is good for for the reader now because it's in there you can't see the URL you really can't tell if it's pointing to your financial institution or the business you're dealing with mm -hmm. so there's some other steps that you can take to take a look at the email and one thing is the header mm -hmm. now the header in an email basically is behind the scenes uh, readers don't see it but it's there and it contains all sorts of information about the email it uh, who it's coming from who it's going to uh, where it came from you know IP domain wise it actually even maps out all the different places it get it has gone to to get to your your inbox mm -hmm. so what we've done is um, I'm presenting a, a slide here real quick that co goes over 
the different items that are within the email. So just to start off with this is let's take a look at what the intent of the email is. That's one thing that you should always question when, when you're looking at an email and you want to kind of check out what it's you know, where it's coming from and what it's doing is the intent. Uh, look for who it's coming from and what they want you to do. If they want you to take any sort of action or if they, they put words in it that, that scares you. So when it's in the spam folder, realize that one, uh, the filters that look at your email have deemed it suspicious in the first place. So mm -hmm. if it's really pointing to something that's kind of iffy, uh, you know, be careful with it. I My recommendation is not to take action on it. But if you're unsure, uh, you can look in the header. And one of the easiest ways to do this is when you are in Yahoo, you select the email that you want to, to look at. And at the top row, there is a bunch of different options. And one of the options that you should do is you click more. And underneath that is a window that will say view full headers. Mm -hmm. So what's on the screen is a couple different items that I would want you to look at. First off is look at the two line. If it says your email address, it's, it's going to you. Now that doesn't mean that it's legitimate, but if it says undisclosed or multiple recipients there, that is something that I would be very leery of because if it's coming from your financial institution and it's about your, your account, it should be to you and not multiple recipients. All right. Some of the other items that I would want you to look at would be where it's coming from. So the from address. Now, if the from address is something very familiar, that actually will help you uh, kind of decide if this is a legitimate email or not. So if the from address is coming from a different domain, uh, if it's coming from a different country code that's not related to the email itself, be very leery of it. If it's coming from uh, some place that you've never even seen or heard of before, that is a good sign that it's not good and just to leave it alone. Uh, some of the other things that you can do is look at the originating IP. The originating IP is where the email actually came from. Now, uh, at the bottom of this slide, I've actually posted two URLs. J jump into that real quick. One of them is the who is. And what you can do is if you want to do some investigation with this, grab that IP, copy it, and go to a website. When that who is website is, is a good one, and just add it in there. It will tell you where, where that IP is at. So if you're dealing with your, say, again, financial institution, and you know your financial institution is based in the same state you're in or the same country you're in, and the IP is coming from a completely different area or different country, that's a good sign that it's not legitimate. Mm -hmm. And one of the other ones that I have there is uh, when you're looking at the received from. Now, there's a lot of stuff in that portion of the header, but looking at the bottom of the received from and working your way up, you will see where it's coming from and where it's bouncing to to get to your inbox. Now, this example right here actually shows that it's coming from a different country code at .ae. Now, .ae is not a U.S.-based country code. It's a different country. But if you did that and looked, looked that up and also looked at the originating IP, they're two completely different countries. Mm -hmm. So with a little bit of extra investigation, and sometimes it does take some time to look into it, mm -hmm. you can verify what email is in your inbox and if it's legitimate. So with those different items to, from, received, originating IP, and just a couple clicks within the internet, you can get a good idea on if this stuff that's sitting in your spam folder is actually legitimate or if it should remain in your spam folder and you just get rid of it. All right. So without looking at, at URLs, the header information is another great tool to help you verify if this email is bad or not. Right. And I guess one of the things we'll have to keep in mind here is that uh, even though, it, I mean, as, as cloud services become more popular, there are potential circumstances where something might be hosted in another country. Um, and uh, it's so it, I wouldn't describe this as conclusive information, but it certainly should feed into your suspicions if there are any. I, I absolutely yeah. agree with you. It's, it's not a foolproof way of determining if it's, if it's good or not, but there are some key aspects in there that will, should help you decide if this is good or bad. Um, as you said, with cloud services and stuff like that, you're right, it's not, it's, it's not 100%, but if you are seeing the originating IP from one place and it's, it's showing something else or the, the um, 
the from address is really just not comfortable with you, you know, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's something that, that I tell people all the time is if you're diving into this, you know, trust your gut because it's not 100% out there. All right. And uh, what you said is, is absolutely, you know, 100%. I agree with that. And uh, you just have to be careful. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Tony. And uh, I guess for folks that are watching this, viewing this, listening to it, uh, if you have your own suggestions on what things to look for, things, experiences, if you had, uh, please share them with us. We'll be happy to, uh, uh, we certainly welcome those, and uh, we'd be happy to share those with the, uh, with the audience here. And, uh, we, you know, perhaps we can have some feedback as well. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, along those lines, our next topic here is our viewer mailbag. The question here is, I think I may have accidentally downloaded some malware on my PC. If I do a system restore back to a point where I made the download, will that eliminate the potential malware? And uh, I guess I'll start out by saying probably not, but I guess, John, we were talking about this a little bit well, earlier. Yeah, What's mean, the it's first good, question? It's gonna, it's gonna depend greatly on the type of the malware too. Right. And it, the long and short of it is probably best just to do a complete re-image of your PC. Because right. you're not gonna be 100% certain. Um, but you know, there's certain types of malware that affects your master boot record. Restoring to a restore point, this restore point is not going to help with that because that's only doing Windows-oriented types of files that have mm -hmm. changed. Whereas your master boot record is right at the, on your boot record of your disk and right. it's injected before Windows even starts. So, um, you know, so those types of things. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to go back and make sure all those registry changes that it thinks right. are supposed to be there are in and uh, make those registry changes and then let the system boot. Right, right. right. <laughs> so like TDSS is a real infamous master boot record type virus uh, uh, that you know is one of those ones that you're not going to be able to do a system restore to recover mm -hmm. from. But there probably are some simpler or trivial pieces of malware that if you did do a system restore, you might be okay. You might also end up with things in your recycle bin and things that are actually still malware. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, like I said, I would depend, if I had some inkling as to what happened, I would be uh, probably uh, Re, you know, re-imaging my machine from mm -hmm. scratch and reinstalling, yeah. including the master boot record. Right. You know, when you rebuild your machine, make sure when you di wipe your disk that you wipe the master boot record as well. well. And then you have to be paying a little bit of attention to the media that you're using True. along right. the way, or even media that's touched the computer in, in the meantime. So that's one of the things, I guess I would have taken just a little bit of a different approach first. Before re-imaging, I think what I would have done is to go to a, uh, a bootable antivirus CD so that you can go to a clean boot and then scan through the system and see if there are any signs of that malware. And uh, there may be some pot potential for restoring it. I mean, it, this is a case where we're not really sure. Right, right. And uh, so you wanna try to get a little more confidence that doing the re-image is gonna be meaningful. I will say that antivirus is not 100% perfect. Yeah, it's absolutely and true. And it usually isn't very good if the malware is very new, as mm -hmm. in like it was written today or yesterday or something like that you wait a couple of weeks and there's a better chance that a signature has been added for whatever's on your system, so long as your system hasn't gone out and updated uh, mm -hmm. and got a new version. Right. But um, uh, I, you know, you can, I, I think it's safe to, if you're not sure if you have malware at all, mm -hmm. to, to go through the process that you, that you went through. Um, yeah. But if you know you had some malware, then you know, it's game over, because you're never gonna be sure. You might get one piece, but you're not gonna get all the pieces that have uh, also been downloaded as a follow-up activity by that piece of malware. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say is, is basically that if you're not, you know, an expert, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between, you know, very sophisticated malware that infects the master boot record and does all these persistence tricks, or just very, very simple stuff. If you can't tell the difference, you're you're better off going for the whole, you know, shebang and and re -wipe, wiping the whole machine mm -hmm. just to be safe. And also, you know. It's, it's not as if the malware announces itself on the system. Right. So you, if you're going to try and pick a system restore point, you should be picking one where you know a good known date prior to the infection. If you don't mm -hmm. have that, you can't make that decision. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I, I agree with John entirely. Yeah, I think the premise here was that you kind of felt like you hit something that was suspicious and you kind of know the event that occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, I think this is kind of a hypothetical uh, scenario that we're talking about here, so but we'd have to go back to the uh, the viewer to really know for certain. I guess well, one we're other uber paranoid. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Like, when we get infected, you know, especially I worry about crime where I don't, don't want to take any chances that I'm going to mm -hmm. log into my bank account and now somebody's got 
because I've got some piece of malware on my machine that I'm not aware of that has captured my login ID and password for my bank and is now taking all my money out of my bank account. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm extra paranoid about uh, stuff more so than maybe 10 years ago where crimeware um, and financially motivated malware was not as, mm -hmm. you know, relevant. A lot of it was more click fraud and these things that really didn't impact me as a user. They were just using my machine mm -hmm. to further their whatever operation they're doing and didn't financially impact me necessarily. But nowadays, that's not the case. Yeah, There's a lot of malware the out there. That, Absolutely. That's, that's a good point is that even if you were to go the, the route of cleaning up your machine, um, I would suggest to this user that there's still more steps you have to go through. Mm -hmm. I would assume that anything that anything, any credentials you entered on the machine during that period would could just treat them as compromise, change them. Yeah, good point. So uh, make sure you go back and change any passwords that you've used, certainly in the meantime, if not anything else that's stored on the machine because they're going to try to pilfer anything that was used on the machine. And if you have any password reuse across different accounts, you ought to be paying attention to that. Uh, and certainly uh, you assume that the password for the machine itself or other user accounts are on there likely have been compromised as well. Right. And I realize how difficult that is mm -hmm. to go back and change and come up with new passwords for everything. But in the long run, it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. A, little, uh, a pound of prevention, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess uh, you know some other. There are other signs that you might pick up on. I mean, as a consequence of a compromise, um, you know, uh, indications that your email account's getting used for things that you didn't intend it to be used for. Uh, I've seen a number of cases where uh, Facebook accounts have been used uh, to try to promulgate other malware to other users or sucker them into uh, divulging information. So those types of scenarios, if you experience an event like that, you should consider that perhaps there has been a compromise on a computer, you need to pay attention to it. One that would scream stop to me is that, that um, a lot of the banking malware will do what's called a web inject. Mm -hmm. They'll actually put code into your browser so that when you browse to a bank's website, if they're aware of that bank and they want to steal credentials for it, they'll throw in extra fields or extra pages mm -hmm. into the login uh, right. script. So if you go to your bank and all of a sudden to log in, they've got an extra page that says, we'd like to have your social security number, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I would, I would at that no point. No more information than usual. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, once there's, there are situations in which you may have to enter like a, you know, a security code or something like that, mm -hmm. but you would never have to enter your your banking like you know personal mm -hmm. identification ever again. So, right. um, like I said, keep an eye out for those kinds of changes. If if for some reason the logic flow has changed dramatically since the last time you logged into your bank, I'd be worried. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to throw in one more big tip off that you're infected. Just one. Uh, well, <laughs> one that I see a lot <laughs> is uh, you'll start to notice all kinds of other applications installed and starting up on your machine, mm. like weather apps and uh, fake antivirus saying you've got some kind of infection on your machine, just click mm -hmm. here to clean it up. But also other, all, all kinds of other, maybe not malicious applications, but applications that the bad actor that's running this botnet has installed on your machine because they get paper install revenue mm -hmm. off of it. Right. So I've seen that a lot on malware machine, malware infected machines, where mm -hmm. there's a piece of malware that's on there, but now it's installing all of these other pseudo legitimate applications on there because they're getting some kind of paper install revenue right. uh, from the owners of that software. Yeah, I, I'd venture to say in cases like that, when you start seeing that type of activity taking place, they've already pilfered whatever they yeah. want from your machine. Mm -hmm. They basically have given up on it and they're passing it on to, you know, they're willing to reveal the fact that your machine's infected. So right. uh, it is indica certainly an indicator to pay attention to. Good point. Good point. And I guess last, uh, but not least, perhaps, um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about devices that we don't really think of as computers. Uh, there are also a lot of devices we don't really think of as media devices as well. So things like you plug in your phone to charge it, it is a media device. It may, it may not actually get infected itself, but may carry the infection to other computers, or if you restore your computer and then plug it back in, it could reinfect the computer. So things to pay attention to, that is if the symptoms come back, obviously, right. that's, a, that's a possibility, but you want to try to avoid that sort of scenario. If your computer can treat it as a thumb drive and you're infected, the infection will treat it as a thumb drive. Exactly. So you'll be moving it just the same as if you're going around with a thumb drive. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a hidden file or something buried in the uh, master boot record associated with that device as well. Is that correct? Well, it's the auto run on auto the thumb run. drive usually. usually. Right, yeah. okay. 
All right, very good. So uh, let's go on and take a look at the internet weather for the last week or th so here. And the uh, I would say there are no real earth breaking activities going on that uh, that but we'll we'll take a look at the weather here and uh, give you some idea what things are going on. First of all, uh, this is scan probes on port 53 TCP DNS. We've been talking about this for some time. And as you can see, we're, ch we're looking at 120 days worth of activity. There's some, what I would describe as pretty aggressive probing activity, but it's not continuous. It's uh, going on very periodically. It's automated on a daily basis, and it's really a single source address in China that's performing this activity. And as we've said many times, it's probably looking around for, and because it's on TCP, probably looking for uh, uh, DNS servers that allow zone transfers. So probably trying to get authoritative domain name information and uh, do some mapping on, of, uh, of the internet, internet domain name space to the extent they're able to do that. Uh, next item here is uh, scam probes on port 8 443-8443, which, uh, I mean, really kind of looks like an alternative port for SSL, perhaps used for a proxy of that sort. There are several applications that use this. It's actually registered to PC Sync, uh, HTTPS, but I found a couple of other applications that are using it, one namely the uh, Symantec Endpoint Protection Manager, and uh, Apple iCalendar apparently uses it as well. In this case, most of the probes are from a research organization. So uh, I would say most of those probes are my, most likely innocuous from a security standpoint, uh, but it's basically suggests that they're looking around for uh, systems that have some sort of vulnerability. I'm not sure specifically which vulnerability they might be looking for, but clearly when you have, uh, for example, a security application that's uh, using a particular port, uh, they may be looking for something that's associated with that unpatched systems. Okay, uh, next item here is scan sources on port 3128 TCP. And uh, we've been reporting on this as uh, basically, I think it's been basically number nine on the uh, top 10 most sources probing. Again, we're looking here at about 90 days worth of activity. And as you can see over perhaps the last 60 days or so, a little bit more, uh, there's been some pretty consistent daily probing activity. Now, again, we're looking here at the number of sources that are doing that probing. Uh, so uh, it's very indicative of botnet activity. This is a little different than some of the botnet activity we've described in other cases where uh, there's a very clear point where all the bots are starting their probing activity and then very clear points where they've stopped that activity. It's not that sort of decay that we've uh, described in some other circumstances in, in previous weeks. But in any case, uh, this is a fairly persistent activity, fairly aggressive activity as well in terms of the number of sources that are doing the probing. But not uh, very significant in the number of probes. So they're really kind of doing a low and slow activity. In fact, uh, if you look at the, and I'm not sure if I actually have a graph here, I think maybe I do, no, I, no. actually what I have is uh, the distribution of the sources that are doing that probing activity. But if you were to look at the number of probes, it actually has gone down a little bit uh, since they started using lots of sources doing that probing. So it's a, it, an attempt to perhaps uh, cloak the activity that's going on. Uh, in a given uh, period of time, we detect on the order of about 2,200 sources doing that probing, and the vast majority of those are coming uh, right out of China. You can see uh, uh, in the geographic mapping, which isn't always accurate, by the way, but the uh, geographic mapping puts things mostly out of China, and there are a couple of smatterings of sources in other places. And I want to point out that this, does not, this map does not reflect in terms of heat. Uh, the number of probes from those sources. It's just uh, merely a mapping of the concentration of sources in a particular area. Next item here, we've been reporting on this for some time as well, scan sources on port 443 TCP. This is, uh, again, a continuation of activity where we've seen uh, most all of these sources are coming out of Argentina and uh, not that many probes coming out of them, but uh, they're certainly in existence. And over the last uh, couple of days here, we have seen a little bit of an increase in the number of sources. I'm not sure what the significance of this, that or the cause is, but um, it certainly isn't diminishing over time. It's staying very stable or, uh, in this case, a small increase for a period of time. And looking at the uh, top most probed ports, 
we've seen a little bit of change here. The biggest change that we've seen is actually on port 1433 TCP, this Microsoft SQL database. Uh, at the top of the list, port 22 uh, TCP uh, SSH. And last week we looked at a, basically a two-year trend of that activity associated with uh, SSH, and uh, that has been increasing significantly over time. That's followed by uh, port 445 TCP, and then followed by uh, port 23 TCP, seeing an increase there over the last week in comparison to previous weeks, uh, followed by port 53 UDP, 8080 TCP, 80 TCP, 443 TCP, which we talked about in terms of the number of sources. This is in terms of the number of probes, and then 3389. So uh, no real surprises in terms of the ports that are showing up here, and uh, just a little bit of movement. And uh, just for the sake of uh, understanding a little bit of what the trend is here, uh, since port 1433 did show up as the second most probe port, we had already looked at port 22 last week. Uh, this is looking at the last year trend of activity for uh, probes on port 1333 TCP. There isn't any real cl clear trend in any direction. I mean, it, it, you could see that uh, over the last six months or so, perhaps a little more probes than we've seen in the previous six months, but it's not as if we see a clear trend of growing or uh, diminishing activity. Comparatively speaking, uh, again, on port 1433 TCP, if we look at the number of sources, uh, we're seeing, a, a, I would say, a fairly clear trend that it's downward, uh, a downward trend. Uh, we saw up on the order of, these aren't huge numbers, on the order of maybe an average of about 750 sources and then uh, ex with spikes up into uh, the thousands back about a year ago. Uh, but since then it's been diminishing down. Now we're on an average of uh, just a little under, looks like about 400 or so sources that are scanning at a given time. So uh, that's, a, that's a good news story to see uh, fewer sources probing for that, uh, for that particular port. Now, in terms of the most sources probing, at the top of the list, port 443, we talked about that. That's that activity out of Argentina, followed by port 445, port 23, 80 TCP, 8080 TCP. And then uh, we talked a little bit earlier about this um, port 3128, which is the squid proxy, and then the uh, 8081 as well. Not much movement here, just a little bit movement upward on port 23 TCP, uh, not significant relative to uh, other activity we've seen in the past. And that's our show for today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. Uh, in particular, we had talked a little bit about the uh, email header uh, discussion. And uh, if you have any feedback or suggestions along those lines, certainly welcome it, as well as other topics. And uh, if you'd like to get notice of new episodes, you can uh, follow us on Twitter. It's at threattrack. The Threat Track video is available on the ATT Tech channel. It's att.com slash Threat Track. It's also available on YouTube. You can look for, uh, do a search on Threat Track and find it there. And it's also available on iTunes in an audio only version. I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Tony, online. And we'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, keep your network safe.